Kicking off our list today strong with an archangel, we are going to start with Salafiel. This angel is usually one of the less scary looking celestials, often depicted as a calm and serene person in prayer. Often Salafiel is pictured holding incense. He's often associated with prayer as is it is his specialty. So far so good. In fact, a lot of people would probably want to summon a relatively positive presence like this. However, it's not all sunshine and rainbows. In addition to being the angel of prayer in orthodox traditions, he's also called upon to help with other things. He is said to help people interpret dreams, which doesn't seem too bad at first until you realize what people often dream about. We are horrifying little monsters at the end of the day, so figuring out what our dreams actually mean holds a lot of potential for terror. He's also able to help people break addictions and tends to protect children, so we'll give him a pass for now. However, there are a couple things that will make you want to keep this angel at arm's length as often as possible. First, Salafiel presides over exorcisms. Getting rid of demons is all well and good, but think about all the exorcisms we've seen over the years. These are not calm and peaceful procedures, they are terrifying, torturous affairs filled with screaming and profanity and blood and bile. Like we've done videos on this channel before featuring terrible exorcisms, so we know the depths of depravity they can reach. Most of the time it would probably be better for all involved just to leave the demons in there and just hold them in. You can, you're, the, you're a vessel for demons now. So summoning Salafiel could put you and those close to you through one hell mm, of an ordeal. If demons are afraid of this guy, you probably should should be too. And one more thing before I go. Apparently he wields a holy sword with immense power and it gains even more power when more people lend him energy. So Salafiel is basically Goku and will punish you for your sins and will also rip demons from your body in horrifying rituals. Angels everyone! Coming in at number 4 we've got Metatron. Oh, no, that's one hell of a name. Don't get it twisted though, it's not a famous Decepticon. They're very different actually. Metatron has a whole lot of different definitions and interpretations, so we'll do our best here to keep things simple. Feel free to shout at me in the comments with uh, your interpretation. However, when an angel is recognized by some but not others, and is also the voice of God and may or may not be the ascended version of Enoch, there's plenty to talk about. The simplest description is that Metatron is the highest of the angels, is the celestial scribe, closest to God, recording what's going on at all times. Plus, he has a very cool transformation. Apparently at some point, a mortal man had his flesh turned to flame his veins to fire, his eyelashes to lightning, and his eyeballs to flaming torches. After all this, he was given a throne next to the throne of glory and given the heavenly name, Metatron. This is just one telling of what happened, but still. Imagine seeing something like that happening before your very eyes. This is a being that could vaporize you in the blink of an eye. No questions asked. Now, this transformation doesn't stop there. Metatron continues to be terrifying even once in heaven. Apparently, as the voice of God and the scribe angel, he's covered with one million million eyes and one million mouths. These mouths all speak different languages so as to communicate with anyone anywhere. And don't think you're getting away with anything with all those eyes trained across the world. Legendary. He's also said to be the largest angel with an enormous body rocking 36 wings. Three representing the Holy Triumvirate, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and then multiplied by the 12 tribes of God's chosen people. All in all, this is an incredibly powerful, high ranking, and complex angel. So if you're gonna summon him, you'd better have a mighty good reason. And if not, you could find yourself in a whole world of trouble. If Metatron's transformation involved fire and lightning in order to ascend, what do you think he's gonna punish you with? I personally don't want to find out. Coming in at number three, we've got Lila. Now here's something truly scary, the angel of childbirth. I don't know about you, but babies are scary. Just deciding one day that you'd like to play God and bring a tiny human into this cruel world, watching as it grows inside of another human and then eventually flies out like a chest burster from alien, blood, viscera, and all. Boy, an angel presides over that. Hmm, maybe don't summon that. She also feuds with Lilith, who tends to prefer destruction over creation, so if you're bringing Lila to the party, you're also going to end up running into Lilith, too. Whenever conception occurs, it's said that Lila speaks to God about the fate of the soon-to-be child. God then chooses the strength, appearance, and destiny of said individual, and Lila plants this seed into a mother's womb. It's awfully deterministic, don't you think? That the moment you're conceived, everything's already just laid out, and we lift it up to an angel and God with no input, no choice? It's a little much. However, there is an interpretation that changes this a bit. Some say that Lila plucks a soul from the Garden of Eden and makes it enter an embryo. There, she shows the soul all of the potential it has 
in life and all of the possible rewards and punishments it may endure. After this terrifying lesson slash indoctrination, she strikes it upon the lip, forming the philtrum and erasing all of its memories of these ideas. From there, it's essentially a blank slate with the ability to become righteous or wicked. But why get rid of the knowledge you already gave it? Why can't everyone be righteous? It just seems like babies are set upon a very tough path with not enough to work with. So come on, Lila, cut them some slack. Coming in at number two, we've got Ramiel. There are two versions of Ramiel we can look to, the Fallen Watcher and the Angel of Hope. Of course, the spookier edition has to be the Watcher, but we will briefly touch on each. As the Archangel of Hope, Ramiel is in charge of bringing folks divine visions and carrying the faithful up to heaven. Like always, I'll be doing a less than generous reading of these tasks. A lot of serial killers claim to have seen divine visions, and uh, they're meant to cleanse the world of sin. Maybe we'll leave that to actual angels and don't let mortals with knives and guns get god complexes. And carrying the faithful up to heaven, like the actual rapture, sounds horrifying to me. Maybe that's just me, you know, the host of the scary YouTube channel and regular blasphemer, but you know, you do what you can. Now, if we want to talk about Ramiel the Watcher, there's also some spooky stuff going on. You might have noticed, we talk about these fallen angels quite often. Ramiel is the sixth of 20 leaders and brought his legions down to earth to take wives, mate with human women, and teach forbidden knowledge. He's also referred to as the Thunder of God, which is particularly terrifying and elicits images of wrath, fire, destruction, and earth-shattering noise. So tell me, do any of these visions of Ramiel sound like something you'd want summoned before you? Probably not. And if that doesn't convince you, just think about the Ramiel that shows up in Evangelion. Oh boy. And finally, at number one, we've got Gadriel. Ah, the one who started it all. Another watcher, he could be the one to blame for all of humanity's failings. That's right, no angel was just gonna head down to Earth on their own and yuck it up solo. Somebody needed to convince all of these divine beings that earthly pleasures were worth throwing their current existence away. Some say that Gadriel was the one to kickstart that whole operation. Yikes. Even worse, he might have been the one to convince Eve to partake in the forbidden fruit. He deceived her, dooming humanity to lifetimes and lifetimes of pain, suffering, and hubris. If there's an angel you don't want to summon, Gadriel should be topping that list for sure. Coming in at number five, we've got the Angel of Death. We'll start off with a no-brainer. If you summon the Angel of Death, you're probably gonna witness some death or quite possibly participate in some death. Whether it's your death or the death of someone close to you or the death of literally everyone around you for miles, there's gonna be some death. Death, death, death. That's what happens when you summon the Angel of Death. Get used to it. By the way, does death sound weird to you now? <laughs> Sounds weird to me. One particularly egregious example of this large-scale killing comes from the story of Passover. In the Hebrew Bible, there's a tale of a pharaoh who refuses to release his Israelite slaves. God brought about a bunch of plagues to convince him to finally set them free, but to no avail. So instead, the angel of death was sent to kill the firstborn sons of Egyptians across the land. If the Israelites smeared the blood of a slaughtered lamb on their front door, the angel would pass them over instead of killing one of their sons. This resulted in quite the catastrophe for the Egyptians though. And that wasn't the worst of it either. Killing all of the firstborn sons of an entire empire wasn't enough for the angel of death. No sir. Apparently, while protecting Jerusalem from an invading army, this angel wiped out over 180,000 men in one night. Like, I get it, you gotta protect what you gotta protect, but that is a lot of human death. When the casualties number in the hundreds of thousands, you might wanna think twice before summoning this angel. It's like dropping a holy nuke on somebody, insane fallout and all. In actuality, folks don't really know exactly what happened when the Assyrians attempted to invade Jerusalem. By all historical metrics, this invading force should have easily taken over the city. However, there are some theories that don't involve literal divine intervention, including mice and the plague that they brought. So what's the better story though, an ill-timed mice-based epidemic or a swooping, slicing, slaughtering angel of death? Coming in at number four, we've got the Watchers. Now, I'm not so sure if the Watchers were ever summoned per se, or if they just decided to swoop down to Earth of their own volition, but either way, you don't want to encounter this group of angels, or you know what? Maybe you do. There's a few things that they got up to that folks might consider pretty cool, even if they ended up birthing a race of giant creatures that eventually drew the ire of God and got the world flooded. 
You win some, you lose some. So if you did decide to bring the watches down to earth, you could probably learn a whole lot of cool stuff. And honestly, I've heard that certain people are really into what the watchers bring to the table in the bedroom. Or I guess the bed in the bedroom. However, these fallen angels are not worth the trouble most of the time. They're known for luring people away from their relatives, their communities, their earthly ties, and having them commit ghastly acts. I won't detail them all because I've got to keep it PG for YouTube's sake, but I'm sure you can imagine what some supernatural beings with powers beyond our comprehension and enough desire to desert literal heaven for some good old fashioned hedonism might get up to. Oh, I wonder if you could comment the stuff you're imagining, or would that get censored too? Maybe we'll save that for another day. So like I was saying before, the Watchers taught the humans they enchanted all sorts of forbidden knowledge. A Pandora's box moment for sure. Humans were introduced to weaponry, cosmetics, mirrors, sorcery, and more. This doesn't seem all that bad, especially because humans would have probably discovered all of it someday anyways. But humans weren't ready for all of this new mind altering knowledge all at once. This incredible volume of previously unimaginable stuff really screwed up their brains and made them act in horrible ways. Kind of like how the internet has rotted away a lot of common sense and decency nowadays, but hey. Eventually, with the birth of gigantic monsters, the angels that didn't come to earth to fornicate with humans decided enough was enough. It was cleansing time. The flood was called and all those who lived on earth were washed away. Time to start again. So even if having access to Lovecrafty and brain chemistry altering knowledge sounds appealing to you, if you do end up summoning a watcher to teach it all to you, you might just end up underwater anyways. And not in a cool fun way like Atlantis or a Gungan city, I'm talking concrete shoes off the end of a pier. Coming in at number 3 we've got Abaddon. Both as a place of destruction and an angel of the abyss, Abaddon is nasty all around. Pretty much invariably, Abaddon is a dark pit of doom. It doesn't matter if you look to the Hebrew Bible or the New Testament, it's bad stuff all the way down with this angel. Like that name literally translates to doom. Let that set the stage. If we leave Abaddon as a place where it is, we can look at some of the terrors brought about by Abaddon the Destroyer. As an angel of the abyss, Abaddon led legions of horrid locusts. These locusts weren't just regular bugs though. They had the shape of horses, the faces of crowned humans, the hair of women, lion's teeth, enormous wings, iron chest plates, and scorpion tails, stinger and all. Plus, if they sting someone with their tail, that person will suffer great torment for five months. That is, unless they have the seal of God on their forehead. Holy smokes. All these details have made Abaddon a particularly popular angel to depict in horror media, from foul fiends in literature to towns of terror filled with entrances to the lake of fire to wildly powerful entities in video games. So while summoning Abaddon might earn you a solid 5 months of hell on earth, it's also kinda cool to see what happens. Weigh your options carefully. Coming in at number 2 we've got Uriel. If you like your reproductive organs unsliced, you'd best avoid Uriel. See, there's an old story that makes me wonder about angelic priorities. Moses almost died because he and his wife were lax with a bit of non-essential surgery for their son. In the book of Genesis, the removal of a piece of skin at the end of a particular body part is considered mandatory. It guarantees that covenant between you and God. So when Moses and his wife Zipporah hadn't gotten around to slicing and dicing their son's parts, God sent Uriel to exact swift revenge. According to the story, he was moments away from dropping Moses on the spot, but Zipporah swept in with a particularly sharp rock and did the deed. Casting the bloody bits of their son upon Moses' feet, Uriel accepted this and refrained from ending the man's life. So if you're not careful, you could anger the Lord for something seemingly insignificant and he might send Uriel after you. And if we're being honest, that's not a way anyone wants to go. So when you sign up to be a part of something like that, maybe check the rules and regulations extra close, lest you get put in the ground for not having your tonsils removed or something. And finally at number one, we've got Jophiel. Widely known as the Archangel of Beauty, you would think that this angel would be cool to summon. Sure, the heavenly beauty might be too much for your human mind to handle, but at least you'd go mad seeing something unspeakably radiant. Here's the thing though, Jophiel doesn't suffer any fools and we're all fools. Well, the first humans to ever roam the earth, Adam and Eve, found this out firsthand. After consuming the forbidden fruit and gaining its hidden knowledge, Jophiel was the one to kick them out of the Garden of Eden. Break the rules? Get booted. I don't know if that can be considered tough love, it's probably just tough. So summoning Jophiel probably means that you've recently done something that goes against God's will and for most folks that is not something they're super enthusiastic about doing. Plus Jophiel is said to wield an enormous flaming sword and as bad as that is, you probably don't ever want to be on the receiving end of it. Coming at number 5 we've got Leviathan. 
Often associated with adjectives like aquatic and enormous, Leviathan is a word we often hear outside of the context of angels. It's a concept at this point. If something is a Leviathan, it's an enormous sea monster, ready to swallow entire ships whole, prepared to annihilate fleets of submarines, waiting for its chance to appear in a monster movie. But here's the thing, Leviathan isn't just some monstrous figure in the ocean, nor is it simply a huge roller coaster in Vaughn. Leviathan is also a demonic angel. Damn, that's a bad title. Let me tell you some more. The sea monster reputation is well earned, as Leviathan often appears or is described as an enormous sea monster or a gigantic whale. Oftentimes, he will destroy ships and other vessels that dare to cross the open sea. Poor sailors, am I right? A lot of folks do end up mixing him up with Behemoth, but we'll let it be for now. There's another roller coaster joke in there somewhere, but I don't have it in me to make it. Leviathan makes appearances throughout ancient texts, from showing up and being described as a Lovecraftian beast with the mere sight of it being overpowering, to a whale that traps another famous character in its belly for three days. That first one also details Leviathan's enormous horrible teeth, and a back covered in shiny shield-like scales. That's not all either. Apparently Leviathan can breathe fire, throws smoke from his nostrils, and has eyes that shine so bright they can blind you. My word, that is an incredible biblical beast. And somehow, some way, he's still considered an angel. What a world we live in, right? Then of course there's the tale of Jonah and the whale, and in this case, Leviathan could very well be that whale. We've seen him described as the enormous underwater individual before, so it fits quite well if you think about it. Overall, this is an angel that nobody wants to encounter, even on a good day. Gigantic, predatory, powerful, and full of folks it ate, Leviathan is crazy. It's for the best that it stays deep underwater, away from everyone else. Coming at number 4, we've got Chalky Dree. Now, instead of listing off 5 specific individual angels, we'll bring in a new group for this one, the Chalky Dree. Sounds kind of funny, but they're serious business. In some of our earlier angelic videos this year, we discussed the classifications of angels a little bit and found out about all sorts of interesting creatures. Gone was the idea that angels had to be glorious humanoid figures descending from above the clouds to play beautiful tunes upon harps. Angels could be chimeric abominations, too hideous for humans to lay eyes upon. That is just the case with the Chalky Dree. Oh yeah. To kick it off, let's talk about where these things live. Not in the heavens, or above the clouds, or anything like that. The Chalky Dree are so much more hardcore than that. These angels have decided to take up residence in the sun. You know, the enormous ball of fire in outer space that burns bright enough to warm our entire planet from 150 million kilometers away? Yeah, they live there. I'm sure their tans are immaculate. Described as marvelous and wonderful, or in my words, overwhelming and intense, these angels take on very interesting forms. Their feet and tails are like that of a lion, offering up claws and speed unlike most others. Something, something, everything the light touches is ours, right Simba? Well, that's only partially true, because the Chalky Dree also have heads like crocodiles, adding in a new measure of deadliness previously unheard of. They're 900 measures in size, whatever that means, and have 12 angelic wings. And for some reason, they seem to be rainbow colored. So a Technicolor Lion-Crocodile combo with angel wings pops out of the sun from time to time to bring heat, dew, and rays to the folks on Earth. You know what? Maybe they're not so bad after all. Coming in at number 3, we've got Belphegor. And we're back to individual powerful angels. This one in particular is a well-known fallen angel, which tends to be the case a lot of the time. Belphegor is associated with plenty of sinful behaviors. There's greed, sloth, discord, selfishness, and more. Although, let's be real, sloth and greed are the biggest in his books. He likes to give mortals great ideas for inventions, therefore filling their minds with selfish greed. They'll devote great parts of their lives to these plans, forgetting all sorts of other important things. And often, if these inventions come to fruition, they don't actually improve the state of the world all that much. Yeah, it's mostly stuff that extracts more wealth from the world in the laziest and most destructive way possible. Then the inventions will also draw their users into sloth, as they make things a little too easy. Classic Belphegor. Interestingly enough, this isn't a fallen angel who was on Lucifer's side from the start. However, when Lucifer and his supporters staged their rebellion against the heavens, Belphegor didn't explicitly side with God either. For this slight, he was inevitably sent down to hell anyways. Damn, you just can't win, eh? However, as we've seen, he's adjusted quite well. After his fall, he took to being a prince of hell quickly and started doing his best to preside over Sloth. At least he's adaptable. 
Coming in at number 2, we've got Mastema. Known for his judgments and punishments of humans, Mastema is one scary angel. He's an arbiter, and you'd do well not to forget that. If Mastema gets the chance, he'll put you six feet under for eternity. Worse yet, he treats his whole job like a sting operation. Instead of sitting back and waiting for humans to do unholy things, he actively tempts mankind with all sorts of stuff to make them act out of turn. That's tough, huh? Like, you think you're living your life and then BAM! Mastema tempting you is something lovely but sinful. It just doesn't seem fair, does it? But that is what this angel does, and he does it well. Some say that Mastema and Belial are the same entity, just seen from different angles. Belial being the more demonic, and Mastema being more angelic. However, their actions are indeed the same, or mostly similar, from leading some of God's armies against angels, to controlling legions of demons to control and tempt humans on Earth. It's even said that Mastema was involved with the Watchers, who ended up causing that massive flood way back when. You know the story. So now Mastema is known as the tester of humans. Even after all of that chaos and mayhem, he's still trusted to do things in the name of God. And I'm not sure which is worse, damning people in the name of Satan or damning people in the name of God. I'd much rather an angel try to help people be better rather than entrapping them and seeing to it that they're sent to hell. But hey, I don't claim to understand how angels work. And finally, at number one, we've got Lucifer. If we were to tally up every list that Lucifer topped, what do you think the final count would be? It's probably a lot higher than I'm estimating, to be honest. But hey, it's not like his spot at the top is undeserved, right? Lucifer worked hard to earn the recognition of people around the world. Hell, there's even a popular TV series featuring this fallen angel. If you can think of a more famous or more fearsome angel than this, please let me know. But until then, we're putting Mr. L right at the tippy top, over and over again. You know the story. Lucifer was an angel without peer. Nobody could stop him. He was the ultimate in heavenly hunks. But then one day he let his pride take over. Instead of being happy that he was the creme de la creme of angels, he thought about usurping God himself. Wrong move, yeah? After organizing something like one third of all the angels in heaven for an uprising, they got beat by the remaining heavenly bodies and sent down to the underworld. So much hope, so much pride, so little execution. Since then, Lucifer slash Satan slash the devil has been watching over hell, doing what he can to bring order to the chaos. Someday he may rise up and take revenge upon those who smote him. Until then though, he's responsible for a whole lot of human folly. Goodness gracious. Coming in at number 5, Mammon. Mammon, also known as Maimon or Plutus, is a powerful fallen angel. Mammon, now a demon, is commonly personified as greed itself. He is the noble demon lord of abundance, prosperity, wealth and injustice. He also is most often personified as a deity. In his appearance, Mammon is somewhat similar to the gods Plutus and Dispater, especially when Plutus appears in the Divine Comedy as a wolf-like demon of wealth, wolves being associated with greed in the Middle Ages. Thomas Aquinas, metaphorically described the sin of greed as Mammon being carried up from hell by a wolf, coming to inflame the human heart with greed. During his time in heaven, he was depicted as forever looking downward at heaven's golden pavement rather than God himself. In fact, Mammon's obsession with gold was to the point where he did not even care about Lucifer's rebellion. But due to the fact that he cared more about material wealth than God, he was cast out by the archangel Gabriel. After the rebellion in heaven, Mammon was banished to hell, where he is the one who finds underground precious metals that his demonic companions used to build their capital city, Pandemonium. He did this by Lucifer's order. Mammon cancels the devils to be happy with what they have got and to create a home for themselves in hell. At some point in time, with the aid of Mulsabet, Mammon created the legendary Twin Blade, which was made from the bones of a fallen angel, salt that was crystallized from the tears of Michael, then melted down with the echo of a god into Damascus steel. The Twin Blade is capable of killing almost anything. In at number 4 we have Asmodeus. Asmodeus is a king of demons and earth spirits, mostly known from the Book of Tobit. The demon is also mentioned in some Talmudic legends, for instance in the story of the construction of the Temple of Solomon. He was thought to be the king of the Nine Hells by some Renaissance Christians. He also represents one of the seven deadly sins, lust. Being the demon of lust, he is responsible for twisting people's sexual desires. It is said that people who fall to Asmodeus' ways will be sentenced to an eternity in the second level of hell. He is also a demon of literary jealousy, anger and revenge. Asmodeus is either a ruthless, brutal monster and mischievous 
demon endowed with a playful and satirical genius. Asmodeus was originally an angel known as Asmodel and was in the order of Cherubim. Right before the war in heaven, he joined Lucifer's rebellion against the Lord, only to be personally defeated by the archangel Raphael. But not before Raphael brutally tore out the lion part of his body and cast him out of heaven with the rebel angels in tow. Asmodeus barely survived the fall due to the injuries inflicted on him by Raphael, but he managed to recover. The lion that was originally part of him, now torn, became something of a pet and steed. He also became one of the seven kings of hell, embodying the sin of lust. He has hundreds of legions of demons under his command. He incites gambling and is the overseer of all the gambling houses in the court of hell. Asmodeus also became the husband of Lilith, though she does not exactly find his presence to be welcoming or tolerable at all. In at number three, we have Belphegor. Belphegor is a fallen angel, now a demon lord that presides over the sin of sloth and is one of the seven princes of hell that rules hell. Belphegor gives people ideas for inventions that will make them rich, which leads them to be greedy and selfish. Belphegor is a lieutenant from hell who had been dispatched to earth on a mission by Satan. As one of the fallen angels, Belphegor was originally a member of the Order of Principalities, and after his fall, he became a demonic counterpart to one of the ten Sephiroth that oversees the Tree of Life. During his time in heaven, Belphegor was a friend of his model and Mammon, but he did not exactly enjoy his angelic duties, foreshadowing his slothful tendencies. Moreover, Belphegor enjoyed crafting strange and intricate objects from all manner of material he could find, which according to him was his outside hobby. Unlike the majority of rebel angels, Belphegor did not join Lucifer's side after he declared the war against heaven, nor was he at God's side either. Despite not being part of Lucifer's rebellion, the fact that he did not join God's side earned him his father's punishment of being cast down to hell alongside other rebel angels. No longer an angel of God, but an archdemon of sloth. Belphegor, along with Asmodeus and Mammon, was soon awakened by the sound of Lucifer's voice calling out to him from newly created hell as a result of his impact from the fall. Belphegor took part in the construction of Pandemonium, given his talent and interest in machinery. He participated by crafting the inner workings of the capital, whilst Mulciber and Mammon worked on both the exterior and interior. He was then present at the Pandemonium during Lucifer's rally. Belphegor had then become one of the seven kings of hell. Belphegor is invoked by mortals who wish to find fame and wealth through invention, often with as little effort as possible. These wishes, as with almost any demonic invocation, are doomed to fail, because Belphegor's true mission is to draw the lazy into the sin of sloth. Through the failure of whatever Belphegor provided to the invoker, he draws them into procrastination and idle dreaming rather than producing, thus damning them. So maybe you're not lazy, you're just damned by Belphegor. Coming in at number two, we have Malok. Malok was once an angel serving God. Due to his own self-interest, he was cast out. He gained a cult following and many worshipped and followed him in ancient times. Child sacrifice is non-existent today, hopefully, but that hasn't always been the case. In ancient times, it was commonly associated with people hoping for greater fertility, free the person or a land. One cult stands out from the rest, the cult of Malak, the Canaanite god of child sacrifice. In the bowels of a big bronze statue with the body of a man and the head of a bull, offerings at least according to the Hebrew Bible were to be reaped through either fire or war. It is said that devotees can still be found today. People prayed and offered to Malak as they believed he was responsible for the weather and fertile agriculture. If they wanted their land and people to thrive, they believed that they must make this sacrifice for the gods or specifically Malak to bless them. Though the biblical account describes children being passed through the fire to Malak, Hebrew prophets are universal in their condemnation of the practice. This has suggested that such sacrifices might have been made to the Abrahamic god by some cult, but were condemned and cast out of the orthodox faith as anthema. Followers argued that this was not a practice of God, but those who were led astray. Others claim that Malak was an angel before he fell, and those who followed him mistook his word for religion. There are religious sacrifices sites still standing around the world today, preserved in time as a reminder of the dark history of following false gods. Although it was more commonplace in ancient culture, there are modern cases of Malak worship. Obviously, these are kept more personal, as this would not be accepted. There have been claims that some influential people in today's society secretly make sacrifices to Malak to gain power and influence over today's world. Of course, we do not have evidence of this, just claims. Do you believe that people are committing such horrible acts for their own self-interest? And finally in at number one we have Lucifer. Lucifer, also known as Satan, the devil, Lightbringer, the light bearer, and the morning star was one of the earliest of God's creations. Also the twin brother of Michael. He was regarded as the wisest, greatest, and most beautiful angel in all of creation, having virtually no equal with only God being his superior. He is infamously known as the angel that rebelled against God and heaven and caused the downfall of mankind. Lucifer was said to be the brightest in all of creation and was the most revered too, and most praised among the angels for his beauty and power. This in the process caused Lucifer to be prideful of himself. So immense was his grace and power that his throne 
was positioned atop a mountain anointed by God himself. Adorned with burning stones known only as the stones of fire, infused with the fires of the sun to give light to the dead and the lost as Lucifer guided them to paradise. It was not until God created humans that Lucifer's pride began to overtake him and grew more rebellious against his father. It soon led to Lucifer becoming dissatisfied with following God alongside the fact that his father favoured the new creations known as humans, spending less time with his own family and more on developing those humans. To add insult to injury, Lucifer would be told by God to watch over and guide these humans, which only made Lucifer look down on these mortals with contempt, especially when having a perfect being like him watching over these creatures like a shepherd over his flock. However, he saw that the humans would be no different than everything else that would be under God's puppet strings and realized that he could perhaps impart his ideas of existentialism on these new creations. He approached one of the two, named Lilith, who was strolling through the primeval plains of the Garden of Eden, and the two had a rather amicable conversation. During the conversation, Lucifer managed to persuade Lilith into siding with him as well. He convinced her that since Lilith had been created from clay, the same as Adam, she is equal to him, and therefore should not not be under him. She would be no puppet bound to any string, and would instead live out her life the way she desires to live it rather than having been told how and why. Lilith was enlightened by the Morning Star's words, and this caused her not to be submissive to Adam and leave him. Being the second born creation of God, Lucifer is a being of incalculable celestial power. He is among the most powerful entities in all of creation. The only two beings that somewhat rival him in the depths of hell are Satan and Beelzebub. After being released onto Earth, Lucifer's mere presence upon breaking through was said to have shook the globe and created several unnatural disasters around certain parts of the world. Moreover, his presence also caused supernatural beings and psychics immense agony and trembled from sheer dread. I don't think you need to tell me that Lucifer should definitely be feared and deserves a top place on this list. Coming in number 5, we've got Abizathibu. Fallen angels tend to have pretty wild names, so we'll kick off with a good one. Abizathibu, Abizathibu, Abizathibu. Keep saying it, I swear nothing bad will happen. While some angels fall from heaven and just chill in the sacrilege paradise that is hell, some have higher hopes for sure. Good old Abizathibu is one of those with goals. Aspirations, a day planner fully loaded with terrible tasks. After following Beelzebub in a grand exit from the Holy Land, he became quite an important demon in hell. Most hell dwellers choose to follow a certain demon or become part of a legion of some sort. This fallen angel has control over all sorts of imprisoned souls. Some say that this charge is both a privilege and a burden though, but I would imagine the same is true of all sorts of tasks in hell. There's much more to this demon though. He doesn't just remain in hell for all of eternity. In fact, there's a wild story about what Abyssithibu got up to above ground. After falling from heaven, he roamed about Egypt, eventually causing a pharaoh's heart to harden. This act of evil inspired the pharaoh to pursue the fleeing Israelites, which ended poorly to say the least. This pursuit resulted in the Pharaoh's army being crushed by the Red Sea. Abizathibu himself was imprisoned in a pillar of water and forced to uphold a pillar of air until a temple's completion. That has to do terrible things to one's mind, so I'm sure whenever this demon escapes, he'll be ready to wreak some vengeful havoc. You'll be able to recognize this angel turned demon rather quickly too. He has two differently colored wings. One is bright red. So if you ever come across an entity with two different colored wings, one being red, you can probably be pretty sure, re reasonably so, that it is Abizathibu. Be careful and watch yourself, as he is the demon of pride known to lead people astray. Coming in number 4, we've got Furfur. Don't be fooled by the somewhat silly name on this one, Furfur is to be feared. A great Earl of Hell, he commands 29 legions of demons that can compel all sorts of atrocities to happen. Take in that his name could be a corruption of the Latin word Furcifer, which means scoundrel. We love a good scoundrel around here, but be aware that when dealing with one face to face, he will almost always come away as the loser. He's been depicted as all sorts of different things, from an angel to a fox to a winged heart, which is essentially an older species of deer, plus wings of course. In those forms, Furfur has been known to trick and mislead people as he is a pathological liar. The imagery of a tricky fox or deer has been used in myths and stories all across the world. Apparently if you compel Furfur into a magical triangle though, he will revert to his true form and speak only the truth. Whether or not you want his scratchy demonic voice telling you truths is a matter of contention though. Trickery and shapeshifting are only the beginning of this entity's power. 
for freaking forced love between a man and woman, which often does not result in desirable outcomes. The actual method Furfur employs to make this false love happen is up in the air, but maybe double check your intentions if you find yourself falling in love in the woods. Furfur can also whip up destructive inclement weather, enormous cracks of lightning, tremendously loud thunder, and storms with rain and wind that put monsoons to shame are all under his control. So don't make him mad lest you end up struck by lightning or drowned in torrential rainfall. If you summon this fallen angel, he may impart some knowledge upon you. Often this knowledge is of divine things and meant to instill happiness. So even though he is known as a demon, he's not all that bad. There are benefits to having him around if you can manage to avoid these storms and potential forced love. Coming at number three, we've got Hadramelech, possibly an ex-angel, possibly a Sumerian sun god. Hadramelech is worshipped by people around the world who wish to offer up sacrifices in exchange for power and wealth. Here's a fun fact, not only is he a chieftain of hell, he's also got a whole bevy of other interesting hellish responsibilities. Firstly, he's the great chancellor of demons, which is pretty neat. He's also president of the devil's general council. Who knew the demons were so democratic and well organized? But here's the kicker, my favorite favorite fact about Adramalek. He is the governor of the Devil's Wardrobe. Tell me you wouldn't want some fashion tips from the Devil's Wardrobe governor. Some seriously killer style on this dude. Probably has one of the original pairs of Satan shoes and everything. To ensure that he looks the part, he takes on the form of either a humanoid mule or a peacock. Or maybe sometimes he's a mule-peacock hybrid. All the above are probably true in some capacity. Be warned, even if you do encounter a fabulously dressed mule peacock man, he's not to be approached. He's described as an enemy of God, greater in ambition, guile, and mischief than Satan, a fiend more cursed, a deeper hypocrite. And we hear a lot of bad things about Satan all the time, so if Andremelech is worse and more cursed than the big guy down there, then we're in for some trouble. Maybe that's why all those hardcore streetwear enthusiasts are so pure evil. They're just channeling Andremelech. Coming in at number two, we've got Andras. Now we're getting into some hardcore ones. Sure, we started with some fallen angels who might have a violent tendency or two or compel people to act in ways that contradict their morals, but that's all just part of life, right? Andras is straight up evil. He is powerful, deadly evil. The Grand Marquis of Hell, 63rd of the 72 Spirits of Solomon, and commanding 30 legions of demons. Boom. If Andros likes somebody, he teaches them to kill their enemies, masters, and servants. Yeah, all, all three categories. He is a bringer of bloodbath and brings them often. Nobody escapes when he's around. To make matters worse, he also gets a kick out of creating bad situations. Sowing discord among people is a chief interest and trouble seems to follow him wherever he goes. It's hard to avoid him too as he does take many forms and can really mess up your day if you're not ready. See, usually magicians look to summon Andros in order to gain some of his power, but he's not easily handled. He will often kill the very people who summoned him if they're not prepared for his arrival. Then he's just free to roam around with his owl head and crazy sword, murdering to his heart's content. Not great. Usually he looks sort of human, with an owl or raven head riding a dark wolf. Very majestic, very cool, very dangerous. Seriously, watch yourself if you even catch a whiff of Andros activity. And finally at number one, we've got Beelzebub. Somebody told me he's got a devil set aside, but I'm not really sure what to make about that. There's also talk of Beelzebub being pretty wicked with the guitar and him stealing a whole lot of souls with it. This is all just hearsay, mind you, so take it with a grain of salt. However, the mythical Beelzebub, famous fallen angel, does have a lot written about him in religious and historical texts. His name means Lord of the Flies, and he rules over those nasty little buggers down in hell. A third fallen angel after Lucifer and Leviathan, Beelzebub has a lot of sway in the Lake of Fire. He's Lucifer's chief lieutenant and wears that title with pride. And speaking of pride, he's also the Demon of Pride. Also gluttony, also the Prince of False Gods. Witches love him as they often mention him as an object of desire, and Beelzebub is a name that popped up quite a bit during the Salem Witch Trials. His presence is everywhere, and many folks blame him for all sorts of demonic possessions throughout history. Just an absolute all-star when it comes to demonic activities. No wonder he's referenced so much in literature, music, movies, and more. Boy, howdy. Coming in at number five, we've got the Angels of Paradiso. Like I said, not all the angels out there are intrinsically linked to major religions. Some are inspired by said worship, but can take on totally new and unimaginably freaky forms when inserted into certain narratives. Enter Bayonetta, 
ancient gun-toting hair-wielding witch with a hate on for these divine beings. In the combo-fueled games, players take control of what Sarah Palin wishes she was in order to punch, kick, whip, and torture the ever-living crap out of these radiant figures. It ends up being a little deeper than that, of course, but I'll leave that to Top 10 Gaming or something. I specifically want to talk about how terrifying the angels in this game are. Taking inspiration from all sorts of pre-existing angels, although the Judeo-Christian is extra strong, these gold and marble-skinned freaks of fancy are down to annihilate anything that gets in their way. The angels are divided into four spheres of influence, each increasing in power. Even the lowly members of the third sphere are terribly powerful and look the part too. Bayonetta can handle them no problem, but imagine facing down one of these monstrosities on your own. Inhuman in four but often adorning porcelain human-shaped masks, these things are the embodiment of uncanny valley nastiness. And as the games progress, these holy abominations get freakier and freakier. Some of the smaller ones have quasi-human figures, but geez. The big angels are exactly what you would expect from a biblical angel of some sort, all fire and whirling parts. Like, look at Belief. This thing has dinosaur legs and an enormous tentacle arm. Then there's Enchant, who reminds me of the wheels that are said to accompany Cherubim. And of course, who could forget Fortitudo, the two-headed dragon with a gigantic upside-down human face as a shield slash diaper. These things are incredibly designed and super terrifying because of it. If I had to choose between fighting these things and demons from another game's universe, uh, you know I'd take the demons every time. One has to wonder, who would win? The angels from Bayonetta or the demons? from Doom. Or even more controversial, and don't kill me for this one, Bayonetta vs. Doom Guy. I'm not even gonna weigh in for fear that I'll incense one million fans on either side. So I'll leave you with the mental image of a marauder fighting Lustitia. Coming in at number 4, we've got Evangelion's Angels. Oh yeah, we're not done with the alternate universe angels quite yet. If you thought some of the angels featured throughout Bayonetta were freaky, we're just getting started. Context matters when you're looking for how scary something is, and in this case, the angels from Evangelion are probably a whole lot freakier than the ones we've previously mentioned. Think about it, 15 years after a catastrophe the likes of which the world has never seen, and then all of a sudden some inhuman, godlike creatures touch down and start to destroy everything. Worse still, the only way to fight these things is to put some traumatized teens into enormous biomechs and make them fight to the death. That is a scary situation. There have been plenty of different interpretations of these angels over the years, with some folks theorizing that they represent some sort of messenger from beyond our understanding of the world, and others think that they're a proto-form of life coming back to reclaim the earth. Regardless of how you understand their purpose, they're extremely powerful, impossible to negotiate with, and looking to methodically eliminate everyone and everything on the planet. And while some of them have vaguely humanoid shapes and relatively easily understood powers, others can be absolutely eldritch in nature. Take Lelisle for example. It takes on the appearance of a gigantic black and white sphere with an impenetrable defense. Anything that attempts to hit it will phase right through it and evas that go up against it often end up in its pocket dimension. Or how about Ariel? appearing to be an enormous bird made of light that can ruin your brain from outer space. When Asuka went to fight it, she ended up experiencing her own personal hell. She relived all of her darkest and most painful memories during the fight and could only eventually take it down by using the Lance of Longinus, a weapon that can cut through any AT field. Then there's Shamshell, who looks like an enormous member. Each angel from Evangelion is terrifying in its own way, and they each find new ways to make the evil pilots' lives living hell. And those are all the people that can actually do something about these monsters. A regular person just has to sit back and watch as these cosmic entities plow through Earth's defenses like a bull in a china shop. Goodness gracious. And don't even get me started on the beings like Adam and Lilith. Maybe next time. Coming in at number 3, we've got Azrael. Back to some more traditional angels now, which, even if they're not quite as delicately fleshed out as some of the storylines from her previous entries, provided inspiration for these more in-depth atrocities. The OGs always command respect. So let's talk about the Archangel of Death. Azrael. A lot of folks have conceptions of the Grim Reaper and similar entities from across time. Azrael plays this role in Islam, carrying souls to the afterlife and coming for those whose time is up. Something tells me that a lot more people would go in peace if Azrael was a little well, less abjectly horrifying. It's said that he has four faces, 4,000 wings, and a body covered in eyes and tongues. Now, at first, the eyes and tongues thing isn't so bad. Like, it's bad, but not the worst thing ever. But apparently, there is one for every human on Earth, which, to me anyways, is pretty much impossible to imagine. Think about all of the writhing, blinking madness embedded in this angel's skin and what that might look like as he comes to carry your soul away. 
No thank you. Coming in at number two, we've got Samael. Another famous Archangel of Death is Samael. More prevalent in Talmudic lore, his name can mean anything from the poison of God, venom of God, or blindness of God. He kills at the behest of God and does so often and with impunity. Off to a good start. He's known to play a similar role to Lucifer across different tales and is often tasked with destroying sinners, which is terrifying to me personally. Another name that Samael is known by is the Seducer. And while he is known to consort with other celestial beings, even mating with the four angels of sacred prostitution, he's not seducing humans in the traditional manner. Instead, he's known to seduce people into acts of evil, drawing them out and causing them to sin so he can do away with them. Narc. There's also the story of him attempting to kill a baby that was still in the womb, which is a pretty out there idea for an angel, don't you think? Apparently, there was a discrepancy about which of two unborn twins would inherit the earth, and Samael's answer was to simply kill one of them before it could be born. This is one angel that will not be imparting you with blessings, no sir. And finally, at number one, we've got Lucifer. Did you really think I was going to get through two lists without talking about the premier fallen angel himself? Come on. Falling victim to pride, the Archangel Lucifer decided to stage an uprising against God. In doing so, he convinced a good portion of the angels to take up arms and go to war against the rest of the heavenly bodies. This resulted in Michael and a whole lot of other angels striking Lucifer down, banishing him to hell, and giving him the new name, Satan. Now, if Samael seduces humans to sin in order to bring them out of the woodwork, Satan does it as a pure act of evil. He now rules over hell and commands armies of demons and sinners. This alone should put him at the top of the worse than demons list. He appears in many texts throughout history, with a particularly famous one being in Dante's Inferno. Here he's half frozen at the center of the ninth circle of hell, gnawing on the ultimate sinners with his multiple faces. He's also depicted in many famous works of art, often as a hideous beast meant to terrify, but also as a powerful commander, leading his armies of the damned. Lucifer is a powerful cultural force, acting as the antithesis to God. You can't have good without evil, and Lucifer plays the latter role very well. Coming in number five, we've got trumpeting angels. Now, don't get me wrong, I love a good trumpet song. It's a beautiful instrument with so much room for expression and range. However, these angels aren't likely looking to play some blues scales, nor are they going to run through a sorrowful ballad. They're playing these trumpets as a way to kick off the horrifying festivities of the end of the world. The seven trumpets shall be played by seven angels, each of which marks the beginning of something terrible. This all happens after humanity has already been reduced to tatters and folks are living in caves. So, hot start. But it does get hotter, because the trumpets are supposed to raise hell. Let's run through all seven and see how we feel. The first trumpet rings out loud and clear, summoning a storm of hellfire. Hail, fire, and boiling blood will rain from the skies upon those still present on earth. This is so spicy hot that all the grass and trees still standing will be burned down to nothing. Anyone outside of their cave dwelling will be cooked too. Now, you might be thinking that the sea is a good, safe place during all of this, but not so. As the second trumpet begins the process of breaking down a burning mountain and setting all the pieces into water, reducing the wildlife to blood and destroying any human-made vessels. Trumpet number three fells a star named Wormwood, sending it careening down to earth. When it touches down, it poisons a portion of all the waters on earth, whether they be rivers, lakes, oceans, or streams. There are stark few comforts left at this point, but things can get worse. All of the light from the sun and stars disappears at the sound of the fourth trumpet, which can't be very well received by the folk still surviving. After darkness reigns, an eagle will swoop down and warn folks of the next trumpets and their consequences. Number five brings about another fallen star, this one carrying a plague of locusts that are meant to torment any non-believers. Now here's where things get really dire. Trumpet six unleashes four very special, very violent angels. This fearsome foursome will send 200 million horsemen down to earth to cut through a third of humanity using fire, smoke, and sulfur. Holy smoke, they're not messing around. Worse yet, their horses barely resemble anything equine. They're chimeric abominations with heads of lions, snake-like tails, and horrible breath. Lastly, number seven kicks off a brand new set of tortures for those who remain on Earth, led by another set of awful angels. Let's talk about that in the next entry. Coming in number four, we have the seven bowls. The trumpets were just a warning, a sign of things to come. And while the angels who played these deadly instruments are bad, the angels in charge of these heavenly bowls are so much worse. Plus, they look like they're bringing down holy offerings, which gives folks false hope before realizing what's actually going on. So seven angels take up seven bowls or vials or whatever vessel you can imagine and bring the contents down to earth. 
They then begin pouring whatever's inside down upon the ground, and then things go really sour. Inside these bowls resides pain and torture, plague and disease. Anyone who made it through the trumpeting will then be annihilated without remorse. Folks develop oozing sores, rivers are filled with blood, people literally combust on the spot. It's all very wild. And the fun doesn't stop there either. As plagues spread through the world and those who have sinned suffer lifetimes of pain, even more madness is poured by these bull-bringing angels. After the Euphrates River dries up, battles between kings of the world will begin and more lives will be lost. And to top everything off, the bulls bring about the most powerful and destructive earthquake that mankind will ever see. No disaster to date will compare to the chaos whipped up by this massive quake, leveling entire cities in seconds, opening up enormous chasms in the earth, and generally making it really hard to have a good time. Damn. So what at first appears to be a reward for surviving the Trumpeteers actually becomes an ever greater punishment. These angels literally split the world apart with the quake after implementing all sorts of legendary suffering. Jeez Louise, I thought these guys were supposed to protect and watch over humanity, not absolutely annihilate everyone. Coming in number three, we've got the False Prophet. Whether this is actually an angel or not is a point of contention, but I believe that this presence is employed by the heavens regardless so we'll allow it. This beastly brute will arrive just in time to sway the hearts of weaker humans, and then condemn them for falling to his trickery. During the divine trumpet solo, a horrifying beast will emerge from the sea, killing many. However, the beast will be injured after this. Once that is complete, the false prophet will rise. This entity will force anyone around to worship the first beast, causing them to be branded with the mark of the beast, or 666. Any who comply will be damned, of course, and will also suffer immensely once the plagues from the bulls rain down. But really, did any mortal have a choice in the matter? The beast from the sea is powerful enough to frighten anyone into submission, so what else are they supposed to do? During a reign of hellfire like that, there's not too much in terms of rational thinking or hope. I suppose it's a test to see if those who are truly devoted to God are ready to simply die with the knowledge that they'll be saved. But still, that is a hardcore trust test. Coming in number two, we've got the of Babylon. Another questionably angelic figure, but one who appears nonetheless. As chaos reigns around the world, the whole of Babylon will descend upon humanity riding a beast with seven heads and ten horns. She will be drunk on the blood of martyrs and saints and looking for a good time. And by good time, I do mean blood. This is interesting, as this particular figure seems to be representative of a political movement at the time. Scholars often accept her as a symbol for Rome, with seven heads representing the seven hills of Rome, and the ten horns standing in for the ten emperors who seem to be pushing for a less Christian world. So even if this promiscuous beast rider wasn't an angel from heaven herself, she represented something that God would have abhorred. And in being a symbol to rally against and hate, this Babylonian beauty probably steered folks back in the direction those at the church appreciated. Interesting, right? And finally, at number one, we've got Abaddon, God's chosen angel of death, the supposed location of the Lake of Fire, and a legendary name overall. This figure is said to have released the locusts mentioned earlier. A swarm of locusts probably isn't that bad in the grand scheme of things. They can block up the sun and eat all your crops, but that is a minor setback. However, Abaddon's locusts, that's a whole other story. These hellish insects are ready to go to war. They're said to appear as war horses with human heads and thorny crowns. With long flowing hair and teeth as sharp and strong as a lion's, they're instructed to torture anyone without the sign of God on their forehead for five long months. It seems a little excessive, but here we are. This is an angel who's all about cleansing the world of impure people through death, and the fact that he also commands these hordes of nightmare bugs only serves to intensify his wicked reputation. If there's an angel better known for cruelty and unforgivingness, let me know. But for now, we'll let Abaddon top the list. I hear there's a hotel somewhere that shares his name. I wonder what it's like. Coming in at number five, we've got the Cherubim. A mainstay in the home decor of grandmothers and churchgoers everywhere, folks tend to love cherubs. They've got chubby little cheeks, lovely little wings, and a whole lot of resemblance to babies. Unlike babies though, cherubs tend not to scream and cry and crap everywhere, which might actually be part of their appeal. But these angels are not as they seem. Sure, they gained quite a bit of popularity in art that depicts them as lovable little lads and lasses, but that's not really what they're supposed to look like. A lot less people would want to hang them in their homes if they actually resembled the way they're described in some texts. So their quasi-human form is about the only part they got right. 
Otherwise, Cherubim are jam-packed with terrible features that would probably give kids nightmares. First off, they don't have just one face, they have four. One of a human, one of a lion, one of an ox, and one of an eagle. That's a lot of freaky, freaky faces. Add in four wings and you've got a wild and crazy creature. But the basic appearance of these things is just the beginning. Those who behold the cherub might notice that it always appears as if it's on fire. You know, for reasons. And apparently they were often accompanied by another indecipherable being. A half-machine, half-creature full of whirling crystalline forms, these interlocking wheels stared down upon folks with hundreds of eyes that covered their entire bodies. Imagine that, being visited by an angel, and instead of seeing a calming, serene humanoid dressed in white, you're greeted by some awful chimeric abomination and its pet crystalline wheel. Insanity. No wonder folks who claim to have seen angels went nuts. Although I think it would be pretty wicked if grandmas started putting art up of these cherubs in their bathrooms. Coming at number four, Seraphim. Keeping with the theme of Im's for a second, now we've got another order of angels that are a whole lot freakier than we often give them credit for. Seraphim are flying serpents. What else do I need to say, honestly? I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say that folks don't often associate flying snakes with angels, but here we are. These winged, wiggly forces are meant to hover above God's throne, singing about how excellent and divine and fantastic he is, which is all well and good, but just think about that for a second. Why would God, the Almighty, the creator of everything and all that is good, need a bunch of snakes to fly around literally singing his praises? It seems like they're doing their best to convince anybody who might hear of it. Who else needs a PR team running around making sure that everyone believes they're actually really good? Hmm. In addition to their sketchy job descriptions, they're just plain weird looking. They fly around with six wings sprouting from their backs, two for their actual airborne maneuvers and four to cover their faces. Oh, and also their feet. Yes, these flying praise ridden snakes also have feet. So are they dragons or do they just have like little feet dangling out by their tails? Unless you personally plan on meeting some angels, we may never know for sure, but that image is not a good one. In some writings on celestial hierarchy, the seraphim are described as such. The name seraphim clearly indicates their ceaseless and eternal revolution about divine principles, their heat and keenness, the exuberance of their intense perpetual tireless activity, and their elevative and energetic assimilation of those below, kindling them and firing them to their own heat, and wholly purifying them by a burning and all-consuming flame, and by the unhidden, unquenchable, changeless, radiant, and enlightening power, dispelling and destroying the shadows of darkness. So if you've ever found yourself influenced by the shadows of darkness, good luck. You know, demons tend to do their best to influence good people to do bad things, but they can, you know, usually be resisted. Angels seem to just want to destroy anything that goes against their vision of holiness. Food for thought. Coming in number three, we've got the Watchers. First of all, any organization known as the Watchers is gonna be creepy. That's just creepy names 101. Second, you know Noah's Ark? The story of God telling his chosen dude that he's gonna flood the whole world in order to hard reset all the sin that's accumulated? Well, the Watchers can essentially be blamed for all that sin. This group of angels managed to fly under God's radar for a while and made their way down to Earth. See, the Watchers saw some of the beautiful women on Earth and found themselves unable to really focus on anything else. Wanting to marry these mortals, the Watchers rebelled against the rest of heaven and went down to Earth to have a good time. While there, they lived hedonistic, overly sexual lives and taught human secret knowledge too. It's said that the Watchers were the first to teach people about weapons, which obviously ended up in brutal violence. Also, the kids they had with human mothers turned out to be a little mm, abnormal. You might be conjuring up images of Greek demigods right now, but that's not the case with Christianity. Instead, these human-angel hybrids turned into 1,000-foot-tall abominations and started killing and eating people. They also forced humans into slavery in order to produce more food, which, you know, good stuff. Way to go, Watchers. Very responsible. Teaching these lower beings about weapons and makeup and then breeding them to make ungodly abominations. In the end, though, God did take revenge and lock these angels away, but damn. Not even the devil could come up with a plot to so thoroughly f everything up. Coming at number two, we've got Belial. If you're a fan of this channel, you've probably heard this name before. However, we don't usually talk about Belial in a biblical context. Now we're talking about Basket Case, a classic. However, the surgically removed basket dwelling monster got his name from this horrific angel. Fitting, especially when you realize what the original Belial got up to. Created right after Lucifer, he was one of the first angels to revolt against God. And that's just the start too. 
Belial led an army against Michael, resulting in untold amounts of carnage. Each army took three wins, and only during the seventh battle did God intervene because he wanted to make sure that Belial lost. For an angel to revolt against the others and then do unspeakable things against the others during battle, that takes a lot of power. And lots of terrifying evil, too. Man, even the strongest from hell were once angels, eh? And coming in at number one, we've got Raphael. To round it all out, let's discuss how even the holiest of forces are capable of the absolute cruelest of acts. Like, unimaginable torture that lasts lifetimes. I guess we already knew all that thanks to Dante's Inferno, but let's take a look at a very specific, pointed act of malice for a second. Raphael. Although he's not one of the named angels in the New Testament, he has become associated with healing and stirring the pool of Bethesda. However, just because he's associated with healing doesn't mean he can't bring the pain. Known for fighting the demon Azazel, he eventually triumphed over this force of evil. So what'd he do when he won? Did he banish the demon? Purify its soul? Nope. He bound their hands and feet together, found a big hole in the desert full of rocks, and then cast the demon into this pit. Apparently, that demon waits there until the day of judgment when he will then subsequently be cast into a pit of fire. Holy smokes, that is a hardcore punishment. I guess the demon deserved it in some way, but geez louise, that's just gotta suck. I'm not sure if folks should find it comforting or not that these supposedly holy beings are so absolutely terrifying. Like, if you ever saw one with your own two eyes, it might have a Lovecraftian madness-inducing effect on you. 